Well, all right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, happy July. Uh, as you might know, it, uh, July is uh, Cell Phone Courtesy Month. And so I encourage you to put your phone down and to be here with us real time, unless you're listening to this on your phone. And then I say thank you for your phone courtesy. Uh, it's also National Anti-Boredom Month, which explains why you're here, because Skeptical and presents is anything but boring. I mean, this is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, right? Um, media literacy over conspiracy theories and critical thinking over magical thinking. Yes, my name is Leanne Lord, and I am so delighted to be your host for this. I am a stand-up comedian, author, and I also co-host uh, Point of Inquiry, the podcast for the Center of Inquiry. And if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me and my work at VeryFunnyLady.com. Now, uh, before we get started, uh, I have a couple of reminders for you. You guys who are vets, you know how this goes. Uh, I'm gonna remind you that the Coronavirus Resource Center is the place to get your inoculation against misinformation. Uh, this week, uh, doctors are saying that even fully vaccinated people need to pay attention to COVID-19 symptoms, such as headache and congestion. And in the world tour that you probably want to miss, uh, the Delta variant has now been spotted in all 50 states. Go, America. You're doing it. <laughs> and uh, an expert suggests that maybe it's time to rethink the one-size-fits-all approach uh, to mask guidance. Uh, I err on the side of matching my mask with my outfit. That's how I do it. Uh, and now uh, here's the wind up and the pitch. You know this part. Uh, I have, um, if you have not already, uh, please round out your reading list with a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Uh, you can do the digital or print, but word to the wise, the print subscription gives you access to the digital subscription. Um, more bang for your intellectual buck. So you can get either or both at skepticalinquire.org. And FYI, uh, the next Skeptical Inquire Presents is on July 22nd. Stuart Weiss will be chatting with us about the persistent attraction of superstitious thinking. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, now, uh, if you are new here, uh, here's the deal. The flow of the evening is really easy. You get to keep doing whatever you're doing. Uh, I'll introduce our guest. I'll try not to talk a mile a minute while I do it. Uh, they'll razzle and dazzle you. And uh, after which we'll open it up for your questions. Uh, you guys are old pros at this, but I, you know, I never know who's a complete newbie. So I, I want everybody to be on the same page. Um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see there's a Q&A. Uh, icon, and that's the place for you to type your questions in the form of a question as best you can. And don't worry, if you miss any of this talk tonight, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And now, I love this part, uh, our next guest, or our, yes, our guest this evening is a senior astronomer and institute fellow at the SETI Institute, the Search for extra, Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I'm kind of hoping we were looking for terrestrial intelligence because it seems a little thin on the ground, but that's not his intro. Um, I have to say what he does tickles me because I, uh, I am a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan. I'm always looking or hoping that the Vogons will show up and destroy Earth. Uh, I have a towel. I'm ready to go. And I, I guess I kind of imagine that Vogon poetry sounds like mumble rap, so I can, I can deal with it. But I do have to say that our guest is, a, is quite the underachiever. Uh, he's written more than 600 articles, uh, written, edited, and contributed to half a dozen books. And every week, he hosts the, the SETI Institute's one-hour science radio show called Big Picture Science. And so here with us to talk about uh, you know, why look for E.T. light years away if he's already in our airspace, you guys. Please welcome Seth Shostak. And Seth, I am delighted to say that you have the con. My goodness. Well, uh, this will be a con of the first water, uh, <laughs> kind of conning the audience here. Well, thank you very much, Leanne. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, although um, all the surroundings look familiar to me somehow. 
I'm actually uh, talking to you from the SETI Institute, which is located in California's Silicon Valley. So uh, if you go to lunch around here, all the people at the other tables, all four of them, will be talking about software. Uh, so, you know, if you find that interesting, you ought to move here. Of course, you won't be able to buy a house or anything, but still. Okay, so this uh, topic was one that I thought might appeal to CFI, although maybe they gave me this title. I'm not, not quite sure. But in any case, why look for ET light years away if he's already in our airspace? And the simple answer to that, and you can spare yourself the next 40 minutes of tedium, is that there is no point in looking hundreds of light years away if ET is just above our heads. But uh, being as you all are all sympathetic to this skeptical point of view, I'm going to tell you why I'm skeptical that that's true. Okay, now let me just see if I can uh, get this to play. Well, it doesn't play. So hang on. Okay, so why do we think there are aliens out there? I mean, you know, it isn't that we've actually found any, although the UFO crowd will tell you that they have, but, you know, astronomers don't feel that they've had any luck in finding ET. But there's a lot of space, and uh, this sounds like a, a line from contact, but the facts are that this photo, which is one of the Hubble deep field photos, shows all this, you know, these little dots and so forth of light, and almost every one of them, with very few exceptions, is a galaxy. That's a star down there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but anyhow, uh, everything else is a galaxy, okay? So each one of those little fuzzy points of light is hundreds of billions of stars, now, of course, E.T. is not going to live on a star unless he's made out of asbestos, but we now know that roughly one in three stars happens to have an Earth-sized planet that's orbiting in what's called the habitable zone, sometimes called the Goldilocks zone or the no parking zone or something, some sort of zone. Now, that zone is uh, the, the region where the planet is not so close to the star that you know water would always boil away and not so far away that it would be frozen solid all the time. So obviously Earth is in that zone because Earth is uh, a, a locus of a lot of liquid water. Now, this graph behind, which you can, by the way, find at the University of Puerto Rico's website, shows the uh, planets around other stars that have already been found that are at least Earth size, okay? And they've actually been ranked uh, by some criteria, mostly how far they are from Earth. The nearest one is around our nearest other star, Proxima Centauri. Well, okay, this graph is just, you know, the imagination of artists, but it does show you that our planet is maybe not all that special. I know you like to think it's special because you live on it, but it may not be all that special. And in fact, this estimate up here, which is based on the, the data that we've acquired so far about exoplanets suggests that there are literally billions, well, tens of billions, maybe a hundred billion planets in our own galaxy that might be cousins of the Earth. And by the way, if that's not enough opportunity for you, keep in mind that we've been able to see at least two trillion other galaxies, each with a similar number of planets. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of space. And if ET is not there, well, that would be a waste of space. Okay, so this is the number of stars visible to our telescopes. And as I say, one in three of them may have a planet where you might find somebody. I think I'll go the other way. All right. But what does all that matter if the aliens are here? Who cares if they're in some galaxy you know, far, far away and long, long ago if they're here? Now, this is, uh, this is the diagram of a UFO from the 1950s when I was still reading about this stuff. And I always kind of wonder how they got the furniture up against the walls because with this cylindrical kind of room, it didn't seem easy to me. Well, this is like a George Adamski thing, but you know, it does seem reasonable that maybe, maybe there are aliens visiting Earth because they are on television, right? Well, yes, but this guy was canceled, I believe. Now, this is another photo of a UFO, and I consider this somewhat immodestly the best of the UFO photos because I actually made this photo myself in my garage. This is a uh, an old lampshade. I found in an abandoned shopping cart here in Mountain View. And I photographed it in the garage and this is what it looks like. This tele, uh, sorry, this particular photo, while obviously fake, uh, has been used on the covers of magazines and stuff like that, which just shows you how sophisticated, uh, you know, our magazine editors really are. Okay, now this is a, just a little bar graph giving you some idea of the extent of the belief that in fact, aliens are in our airspace. And I think any of you who are uh, reading this skeptic, uh, skeptical inquire know something about this or even just reading some articles 
right? The majority of, well, let's take that back. The roughly 40%, more like 33% of Americans say aliens are here. 80% of them say, well, aliens exist. That's the purple bar. But the orange bar is what fraction of them think that they're, you know, uh, no, the blue bar. What fraction of them think that they're visiting Earth? I, I get confused with all these bars because they don't let me in the inside anymore. Okay, so the blue bar is 40%. It's, you know, typically one in three Americans think that's true. Uh, one in 10 has seen a UFO and the, 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 the very, you know, short bar all the way to the right, that's the fraction of Americans who think they've been abducted for experiments their moms would not approve of by aliens. It's about 2%. And you might say, well, that's not very interesting, 2%. But I'm sure it's very interesting for the people who get abducted. And in fact, you know, 2% of the population of the United States is on the order of six or seven million people that have been abducted by aliens. And you might think that the government would get, you know, involved with that because that sounds like a fairly severe problem. Okay. Now, here are a couple of reasons why I doubt that the aliens are actually visiting. I made this photograph in the Mojave Desert. I don't know what it is, but anyhow, this is reason number one. You might consider these things because, you know, there are plenty of articles in the Skeptical Inquirer about, in fact, you know, the whole UFO biz and particular uh, aspects of it. But some of these things are sort of overarching uh, reasons why you should be skeptical. The amount of energy required to come here from some other star system is a lot. I mean, once you get underway, it doesn't cost you any more to keep going, but to get underway at a reasonable speed takes quite a bit, bit of energy. And if you come here at a, a speed that would get you here from the nearest star and say 50 years, 100 years, something like that, I mean, that's a long time to be sitting in a middle seat, but that energy is thousands of years worth of our own energy consumption. That's a lot of energy. That's a, a big pile of coal, if that's what you're using to power your saucer. So that's, that's something that has been known for you know 50 years. I mean, there's nothing especially new about that, but it's totally ignored in the whole UFO literature. How do they get here? What sort of propulsion could bring them here in an amount of time that's short compared to the lifetime of the crew? And uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Tourism is not trivial. Now, there's this question too, which is also very seldom discussed. Why are they here now? Just, just in time to haul you out of your bedroom and improve your, your social life. Well, uh, you know, are, if you ask people who think that the aliens are visiting, why are they here now? They have uh, explanations for that. They say, look, the aliens don't like us having these nuclear weapons. If we're not a threat to them, at least we're a threat to one another. And consequently, they're here to help. The uh, second thing they occasionally talk about is the fact that, well, they know that we're wrecking the climate and uh, they you know, want to help us in that regard. Now, I can't say anything about how aliens really feel about these issues. Uh, we don't really know that. But it's, in any case, you can say that the aliens don't know about either of these things either. The only way they would know about either of these facts, our nuclear weaponry, or climate change is if they had been picking up our television or radio and were listening. But remember, television and radio go at the speed of light. And that means that, you know, we've had high frequency, high powered transmissions since the Second World War. So the earliest newscasts, which probably didn't have much about climate change and probably not even much about nuclear war, but who knows, were, you know, at the end of the Second World War, say 70 years ago. And that means that any planets more than 70 light years away have no idea what we're doing here on earth and i'm sure they don't even know that homo sapiens exists let alone have decided that well yeah we ought to spend the money to go down there and somehow you know keep them from themselves it doesn't make any sense and in fact if they're more than 35 light years away there hasn't been enough time for that bad news to get to them for them to hop in their you know, speed of light transports and come here to just flit around the atmosphere. Well, within 35 light years, there really aren't many uh, star systems. There may be, you know, a dozen or two dozen, something like that. The chances that any aliens know about Homo sapiens is very, very small. Okay, so, you know, if you're counting on them to abduct you, uh, talk to your neighbor about alternative strategies because the chances aren't very great. Okay, well, having said all that, it doesn't violate physics for aliens to come here, so maybe we should just look at the evidence. Let's just look at the evidence, uh, how Smith would sort of say. Well, the first 
sort of famous UFO report happened in 1947. The less famous ones also happened in 1947. 1947 was a good time to visit Earth. And uh, here you see the Roswell Daily Record. Many of you have seen this headline. Roswell Army Air Force captures flying saucer because something fell into the dirt about 40 miles northwest of the city of Roswell. And a rancher found it and brought it into Roswell. He went to the radio station and eventually they went to the military. There was a, well, there still is, I think, an Air Force base south of Roswell. In fact, those were the planes that dropped the A-bombs on Japan were based. So there was military activity down there and they claimed it was a flying saucer. And then somebody said, well, that's, that's nutty. So the next day they said it was a, a you know, a, a weather balloon, which was just as nutty. But because, I'm going to go back here for a moment, because the Air Force clearly lied about what they were doing, ever since the people who like to believe that some uh, of these reported objects in the sky are actually alien craft have a reason to say the government's covering up. This is a particularly American phenomenon. I've lived in Europe for quite a while. And, uh, you know, you don't have this problem here. They don't distrust the government. And, you know, here in the United States, you could say, well, okay, maybe they're, you know, a little too paranoid to distrust the government. But on the other hand, the government does keep secrets occasionally just to keep the whole controversy going. Okay, so this was actually an experiment. The whole thing about Roswell was uh, expl uh, explained actually by the Air Force later on. It was part of a secret program to try and find out if the Soviet Union had the bomb. So that explains all the phenomena, but nobody likes to believe that. Uh, there's another argument that's uh, put forth by some people in the UFO community that the UFOs preferentially like to hang out around our missile silos and other military installations. Uh, well, there are two reasons that might explain this aside from their interests. Or, well, one reason is that many of the reports are made by military pilots. So there is a tendency for them to be near military installations, particularly if you're talking about offshore uh, aircraft like Navy fighter jets. Well, okay, so that explains that. But the other thing is ask yourself, how reasonable is it that you've come all the way to earth, you have the technology to, to the, the Vogons, you know, to come, I don't know, a hundred light years to earth and you're gonna spend your time looking at their nuclear missile facilities. That would be like me going back to the time of the Neanderthals and spending all my time looking at where they make their spears. I doesn't make, no, doesn't make any sense to me, but anyhow. Okay, uh, here's another bit of evidence that's uh, frequently proffered, or at least it has been for about 30 years now, the so-called crop circles. And uh, this is one that's uh, particularly attractive, I think. However, these almost exclusively appear in the counties of Hampshire and Wiltshire in Southern England. And for some reason, that's all that the aliens uh, the only people the aliens seem to want to talk to, because these are interpreted by many people as being some sort of communication to us from aliens. Now, let me just tell you how dumb that is, because if you look at this thing, I mean, it's, as I say, it wouldn't look bad in the backyard, perhaps, if you had that kind of a backyard, but it's very, very symmetric. It's symmetric on all sorts of axes about, you can flip it over, you can, you know, rotate it, uh, uh, 60 degrees and it, you know, replicates, it's highly symmetric. And anybody who knows information theory knows that when something is highly symmetric, there's essentially no information in it, right? It's like, you know, I don't know, you're in the bathroom for a while, somebody else's, somebody else's bathroom, and you look down and you see all these black and white tiles. Maybe this is a, I don't know, an old bathroom in, in Brooklyn. They used to put little black and white tiles down there, but you know, they were regularly ordered, right? Every other one was a different color. So there's nothing to be read there. You have to take a magazine or a newspaper into the bathroom if you wish to read something because you can't read the floor tiles. It's so symmetric, there's no information in it, right? Well, that's the same with the crop circle. So it doesn't make too much sense. Besides, right? These things are usually plowed away by the farmers the next day. So it's not a very long lasting uh, communication in any case. Um, now, here's a question that Ben Radford actually of uh, CFI has addressed more than once. Uh, and that is why are the photos, the reports of UFOs so crummy? The photos are really terrible. And 
This, despite the fact that everybody carries around a camera and a video camera in their pocket now, and yet the photos haven't gotten better. You still can't read the lettering on these craft. It seems that the aliens are always backing off at the same rate that the cameras are getting better. I think that's a good point. Here are a couple of things that you might keep in mind also with regard to cameras and photography, because, you know, I, I get emails from people who are having difficulty with aliens in their personal lives essentially every day. And I asked all of them, I say, do you have any photos or videos or something? And about half of them do. And, and they, they're willing to send them to me. And as it is, photography is a longstanding hobby with me. So very often I can tell them, well, that's internal reflection in the zoom lens or whatever. Right. I've never seen anything that I thought, by God, this is it. Here, here's a very common example of the kind of things you see. Uh, your cell phone doesn't have a, a, a mechanical shutter the way your camera might, where it actually, you know, uh, a, a blade flips up, it exposes the, either the film or the sensor, and then it closes again. The kind of shutters they have are electronic shutters. They're called rolling shutters. Look it up if you're really interested. But what they do is they extend objects uh, that are, well, parallel to the direction of the readout of the shutter. And that's typically horizontal. So what that means is that a bird will get, you know, sort of elongated. So this thing, which seems to have a strange shape, probably doesn't have a strange shape if you would use another shutter. <laughs> this is a common problem. Then there's, of course, the big disclosure. This is a photo from the front page of the New York Times in 2017. I think it was December when there was an article about leaked videos from the Navy, uh, purportedly showing UFOs or something that might be UFOs. Now, these photos were all made by Navy pilots, uh, all flying the same kind of aircraft, F-18 super hornets and uh, all the photos were made by that kind of aircraft which is suspicious on the face of it right that would be like saying by gosh you know lots of people have seen bigfoot when they're driving through you know oregon or something but they only see them if they're driving buicks right so if, if they're not driving a buick they won't see them but if they are they might right so it's the same sort of thing here and you'd say well there must be something about buicks Right. Or would you say, no, the, the Bigfoot have, uh, or, or Big Feet, whatever the plural is, would uh, have arranged things so they can only be seen by people in Buicks. That makes even less uh, sense. But anyhow, this big exposure, exposure hello, disclosure, this uh, shows you a very, I think, intriguing trend in the whole UFO uh, discussion these days. And that is with about the last five years, the UFO community has said that, you know, we haven't convinced the science community that we're actually being visited, but that's because, well, maybe they're just not gonna listen to us, but more than that, all the good evidence is being kept secret by the government. You will recognize this as an argument from ignorance, but okay, they not to say that the government isn't ignorant or anything, but that's what you call it. When I can't tell you why, you know, I can't show you the good evidence because it's being kept secret. Well. Um, Mick West, amongst others, have, you know, kind of explained what could be the uh, phenomena that account for these kinds of videos. Remember, this is an infrared camera. It's sensitive to heat. So that thing in the middle is, uh, you know, an elongated blob of heat, right? Well, imagine that by chance, this uh, fighter jet is following, a, say, a commercial jet, a four-engine commercial jet that's 50, 100 miles in front of it. Actually, the, the horizon at the altitude that these jets were flying would be 180 miles away. So it could certainly see something 100 miles away. That is, it's above the horizon. Well, you wouldn't actually see the plane because they're not high resolution cameras, but the, the planes make a lot of heat coming out the back. You're looking up the tailpipe, <laughs> the tailpipes of the jet engines on this craft. And given that it's so far away, of course, there isn't much resolution in the camera and these things get blurred, right? So you get this double blobby thing and that looks, pretty much like that, right? So that's one explanation. You can say, oh, I don't believe it. Well, you don't have to believe it, but it is an alternative explanation that makes sense and doesn't require anything terribly extraordinary like visiting aliens. It just requires, you know, one of the 100,000 flights a day, commercial flights a day to be within 100 miles or so of that, uh, that Navy jet. Okay. Uh, there are others, you can find them all, as I say, online, and probably you've already seen them. Here are a couple of random fun facts that uh, might make you more popular at your next cocktail party. 
uh, these are there's a plot of America's UFO sightings, and you notice that they tend to peak during drinking hours uh, after work. I don't know what that means. Maybe it means something. Here's another graph <laughs> showing when the aliens prefer to appear: Fourth of July, New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, all um, all holidays connected with the use of drink. Okay. Now, the most beloved rationalizations for why so few scientists actually look into this is A, you know, all the good, good stuff is being kept secret. Here's Area 51. Um, I don't know if you, you were part of the team that stormed Area 51 about a year ago. It wasn't all that exciting. Um, so argument from ignorance, right? We don't know what the government knows and if they'd only come clean, but they apparently have come clean and there's nothing new in that report. It doesn't even mention aliens. The report that dropped onto the desks of Congress people about two weeks ago. That, you know, it's, I think there's very little joy in that report for the UFO community. Uh, there's the argument from authority. Here's the Honorable Paul Hellyer of Canada, former defense minister who uh, has said, yep, the aliens are here. I happen to have known personally, actually, uh, Edgar Mitchell, um, an Apollo astronaut, and he was convinced that they were here too. I went up and talked to him about that once at a, at a meeting. And he said, well, Seth, he said, I didn't actually see this stuff myself, but somebody told me. So you can make that make of that what you will. Argument from authority, if somebody in, you know, in a good position or you know, just a, a, an airline pilot or a, a military person, if they say, yep, the aliens are here, then you, know, you feel like you should believe it, but maybe you shouldn't. This is the thing that I hear every single time somebody calls me up and says, Seth, I've got something very uh, important for you. And I know exactly what that means. They're going to tell me about a UFO site. And then when I say, well, you know, it could have been this, that, and the other. And they say, look, I know what I saw. I don't know how that's supposed to convince me. But if they know what they saw, why were they calling me in the first place? I always wonder about that. All right. Uh, you know, there are something like 780 satellites in orbit around the Earth that have cameras that are pointed down. Right. You see it on the nightly news when they show the weather maps, but you know, they're cameras which, with much better resolution, right? Uh, if you go on Google Earth, you know, you can find your house, but you can find your car too. And those are, if you will, the unclassified satellites. The classified ones can probably see, you know, uh, the, I know the hood ornament of your car, in case your car has a hood ornament. Um, but they don't seem to see the, the aliens and you say, oh, well, that's because they're all the US military satellites. No, they're not. There are many countries that have satellites, so you have to assume an international cabal keeping all this quiet. There's also the space fence, um, which uh, you know is another uh, project that uh, your tax dollars, if you're American, are supporting, and that is to monitor all the space junk out there. That's strategically important. This the new U.S. Space Force has actually built this thing, and it's uh, located on an island in the Pacific. But anyhow, it's a big radar installation. And it can find things the size of a marble, you know, in low Earth orbit. Now, I don't imagine that the aliens are piloting craft that are smaller than a marble. I, I, I'm not sure I could swear to that, but it doesn't seem reasonable. And, and it doesn't see anything either. And you can say, oh, that's the military again. Yeah, right. But, you know, there, there are a lot of radar installations. There are radar installations at every airport of, of any note in the world. And they don't see the, the aliens. A marble low earth orbit. Oh, here's a note for those of you who are amateur astronomers, either in this country or I don't know, South Africa or something. The, the uh, amateur astronomers, and I don't know how many there are, but there are at least 500,000 of them. Let's make a conservative estimate. They should see several UFOs per week, but they don't, right? You can say, oh, they're, they're being hushed up by the government, right? <laughs> okay, so why no science museum? There are only a couple of reasons offered by the UFO folk about this one is the government is covering up, but you know, here the government was ordered not to cover up. And it seems that uh, from the point of view of anybody with the opinion that the aliens are visiting, the government's still covering up or scientists won't look at the evidence, which is nonsense, because of course we would look at the evidence, right? Uh, one scientist told me, he said, Shostak, if I thought there was a 1% chance that any of this is true, I would spend all my time working on it, right? And they're not. So uh, just wrapping up, you know, the idea that they might be here. Yeah, they, they're obviously not helping us with climate change. They, they haven't um, affected any reduction in the number of nuclear weapons that we have around the world. Uh, they're not solving any of our problems. But on the other hand, they're not killing anybody. They don't seem to bring down any of our planes. 
and they don't seem to do anything except occasionally abduct folk. So they're really the best house guests ever. Now, let me just talk to you about another idea for finding the aliens, and that is to do what is one of our projects here at the SETI Institute, and that is SETI, which is also almost my name, but not quite. SETI is just a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's the idea of, well, exactly what you saw in the movie Contact, if you saw the movie Contact, namely, could it be that uh, you know we could find the aliens by picking up radio or television or radar broadcasts from them, whether they're de deliberately sending them our way or not? That idea goes back to 1960 when this guy, Frank Drake, whose office is down the hall here, uh, he did the first experiment using that antenna that you see in the photo in West Virginia. He pointed at a couple of nearby stars, spent two weeks trying to pick up a signal. He didn't, he didn't pick up any signal, but that was the beginning of the modern SETI experiment. And it's been done all around the world. The SETI Institute went to this telescope in Australia. Anybody who had the good fortune to see the movie The Dish knows about this particular <laughs> instrument because it was the star. Uh, anyhow, so we've used telescopes around the world. But to cut to the chase, because you're kind of wondering, when, when are we going to hear about that chase? The uh, cut to the chase, we haven't heard anything. Now, this is a little different from the UFO folk because the UFO folk claim that they have found the aliens, right? They're in these Navy videos or they're whatever, right? We don't make that claim. We don't seem to have picked up a signal yet. And if we did, of course, we would check it out because what we're doing is different than the UFO approach, which is to analyze all these sightings. What we do is actually do an experiment. And if an experiment picks up a signal that looks promising, and of course, we, we pick up many, many signals. If you pick up a signal that looks promising, then you check it out by calling up somebody at another observatory and see if they can replicate what you found. Now, how do we explain the fact that we've been doing this for a while and we still haven't heard anything? You know, it sounds like my mom says, Seth, when are you going to get a real job? But my, my answer to that is, mom, I don't want a real, real job. Okay, anyhow, so here are some possible explanations. Maybe there just aren't any aliens. That seems hard to believe given that there are a trillion planets in the Milky Way and, a, and two trillion other galaxies, each with a trillion planets. I mean, if there are no aliens, then you got to say whatever, whatever the reason, Earth is some sort of miracle. And uh, if you're a member of the CFI group, uh, you probably don't believe in miracles. Okay, so that's one possibility, but I reject that. Maybe they're hiding from us. You know, maybe some of them are because you know, they're, they're worried about revealing their presence, but I, I don't know if all of them are. Maybe we just haven't had a, you know, a, a comprehensive enough search, haven't looked in enough places. That's to me the most likely here. Or maybe we just don't have enough sensitivity. And I'll skip that graph because I know every time you show a graph, you lose 10% of the audience. And I think I've already shown 12. Okay, now here's a number which will also lose 20% of the audience. Here's our array of antennas about 300 miles north of San Francisco, the Allen Telescope Array. And uh, this is the kind of signal it could find. So for the propeller heads in the audience, 10 to the minus 24 watts per square meter per hertz is kind of the sensitivity. And that applies to all SETI experiments. And to translate that into something, 200 light years away, if the aliens were that far, that's the kind of power they would have to wield in order for us to hear them. So let's say 10 to the 14th watts, if they're radiating in all directions, and if they don't know that we're here, they probably would be radiating in all directions for us to pick up anything. Now that's a lot of power. I just want you to know your energy bill would be uh, you know, rather considerable. It's more than the total power used by all of Homo sapiens, and not just power generation, but also your car, your Wii, your cell phone, right? <laughs> Airplanes, cars, railroads, all of that. You add it all together and you get less power than it would take for us to hear the aliens if they were 200 light years away. You might say, why 200 light years? It's only because within that distance there are about a million star systems. And so I figure, you know, maybe that's a big enough sample to contain some aliens, who knows? Now, this cost might be too much, even for aliens. I mean, they've invested wisely and so forth, but maybe they don't even have enough money to, to marshal that kind of an effort, right? Now they could minimize the effort if only they would broadcast in specific directions by using a bunch of arrays big array telescopes. This was a, actually a, a, a proposed plan for SETI years ago before we realized the world wasn't interested in supporting us with the amount of uh, funding that you need to actually do this experiment. 
but you, you, you know, you could say, well, maybe they're beaming so they don't have to spend all that much money on kilowatt hours. Maybe, maybe. But again, the aliens don't know about humans yet. What you see plotted in this pseudo three-dimensional graph are all the nearby stars, right, within about 50 light years, okay? And so these are all the ones that are close enough that they've had enough time to pick up our reality television, decide they don't like it, and launch their interstellar battle wagons back to Earth to, you know, obliterate the planet because they're, they're offended by our TV programming, right? And as you can see, there are a couple of dozen of them, maybe three dozen, four dozen stars that are that close. That's a pretty small sample. It's safe to say the aliens don't know we're here, despite what your neighbor is telling you, okay? So you can't count on them beaming signals our way because there's very little to, uh, to induce them to do that. But here's another idea, plan B. Forget about looking for signals. Look for artifacts, which is to say, you know, big constructions. Remember, the universe is three times as old as the, uh, as the solar system, right, as the Earth. So, you know, there are plenty of societies out there that could be not just millions of years more advanced, even billions of years more advanced than we are. And it's kind of hard to imagine what they would do. It would be like asking <laughs> protozoa, you know, what do you think uh, the, the, the reigning life form on this planet will do in another billion years? I mean, they would have no idea. You could ask the trilobites and they wouldn't do any better. And in fact, even the dinosaurs are not really good at just projecting forward another 70 million years. They would have no idea what we're doing. So for us to assume that we know what they're doing, you know, that's a big assumption. But maybe they built stuff big enough for us to see, right? They've had a big start. And the advantage of looking for big constructions, artifacts, if you will, is that, well, you don't have to count on the alien signal intercepting your antenna just when you're looking, right? That's, that's a big factor, actually. Okay, so you don't, it's, it's been said, it's been likened to firing a bullet <laughs> uh, you know, uh, across the backyard and hitting a bullet fired by somebody else at the other side of the yard in mid-flight. It could happen, but it's pretty unlikely. So it solves that problem because if it's just artifacts, if it's something they build it, that signal is always on. You just have to look around at whatever you're doing for ordinary astronomy and maybe you'll find something. It also uh, eliminates this problem that has been pointed out most famously by Stephen Hawking, although he wasn't the first nor the last. And that is maybe there's some danger in sending signals into space, right? Because maybe you just wake, wake up the sleeping giants that might be out there and they decide to destroy your, your, uh, your planet, beginning with Los Angeles, of course. But those of us here in, the, uh, in Northern California actually don't have too much of a problem with the aliens flattening LA. All right, now, so you get rid of that problem entirely because if you're just building an artifact, I mean, yeah, you reveal your, your, your presence, but we don't reveal our presence by, you know, I mean, if we find an artifact, they, they certainly don't know that we've done that. And they don't have to be alive now. That's a good point because you know, if somebody gave you this task for the weekend, go find the pharaohs of Egypt. We'd have a hard time because they're all gone now, but you would know that there were pharaohs in Egypt because they arranged for the construction of these pointy buildings in the desert just to the, uh, you know, east of Cairo. Now, you could say, oh, well, you know, actually, <laughs> this is an artifact because these pyramids were built by aliens, not Egyptians, which is a real slur on the Egyptians. They were fully capable of building these things. And if the aliens had bothered to leave one of their cell phones in one of the chambers in these things, I would believe that aliens had constructed them. Otherwise, I'm willing to give that credit to the Egyptians. But I'm trying to show you that even though the pharaohs have been gone for 3,000 years, you can still find evidence of their presence because you're looking for something that's they built, that's big, that you can find, and that, you know, incontrovertibly tells you that they were once there. Now in the sky, there may be such things too. This is Tabby Star, and there's a whole history why it's named that, but you can see here in this graph, for the four of you who are still conscious, in this graph is just plotted the brightness of this star. Uh, its real name is, well, it's, 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 it has a catalog number in the Kepler catalog, 8462852, uh, which kind of rolls off the tongue. Okay, and you can see that, you know, the brightness has changed with time. Now, you can try an experiment yourself and go out and take a look at the sun uh, today and then look at it tomorrow and then the day after look at it again. I mean, I don't recommend this because, you know, your vision will be shot within first 10 minutes, but okay. You know, if you could just do it with a light meter, 
you would find that the sun is always the same brightness, right? It's dimmed only by clouds or other atmospheric phenomena, but the sun is the same brightness day to day. It varies by 0.01% because of, you know, sunspots and stuff like that, but it's basically the same. Well, this star dropped in brightness by more than 20% for a while, and then, you know, dropped by five or 10% later on. And what was causing this? Well, it was hypothesized that what was causing it was an alien megastructure, some big artifact. Maybe some aliens actually built a Dyson sphere, patent pending. Dyson spheres were the idea of Freeman Dyson, the physicist, uh, the British physicist, although he worked largely in New Jersey eventually. And uh, he said, look, if you really want to get a lot of energy and you don't want to pollute the planet with all sorts of CO2 and stuff like that, what you do is you take apart a nearby world that's kind of useless like Neptune and you reassemble it in a big sphere around the sun and you line up the inside with solar cells and you beam all that collected electrical power or energy, you beam it back to earth on a microwave beam. You could do that. We could do it now, but it's expensive, <laughs> but you could do it. And what he's saying is a really advanced societies would do that. So there was the thought that maybe what was causing this, this uh, cabbie star to get dimmer occasionally was that bits and pieces of this Dyson sphere were blocking the light. Could be, but now we've found from, uh, we've found other evidence, I won't go into it that it's actually not a Dyson sphere, it's just dust clouds around that star. A little disappointing, but it could have worked out differently. Another place to look for uh, alien artifacts is the center of our galaxy. I don't know how many of you have been there. It's a happening place, at least compared to where we are. The only trouble is it's 28,000 light years away, so be prepared for a long walk, uh, rocket ride. This is a photo in the direction of uh, Alpha Centauri. That's not the center of our galaxy, but those are nearby stars. And maybe, you know, there's a planet there that has something on it. It's all very reminiscent of 2001, A Space Odyssey, when they found this monolith on the moon. That's an artifact. So uh, just leave you with a final thought, and that is we've been talking about aliens as if they were something like these guys. Uh, no whites to their eyes, which makes it tough to determine when you're sitting across from them at dinner, whether they're looking at you or something else. But anyhow, uh, but you know, we always imagine the aliens to be kind of like us, right? Those guys look like us. It look like my cousins. All right. Well, they're probably not going to be like us. This is a plot by Hans Morovich, a roboticist uh, in uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And uh, this, this plot was made more than 10 years ago. But what he plots is how much compute power you can buy for $1,000 as a function of time. And you can see, of course, you can plot or you get more and more compute power for your $1,000. Now, this plot ends in 2007. We're now in 221. So, uh, you know, depending on what extrapolation you take. For $1,000, you can buy a laptop with the compute power of a monkey brain, or if you're more optimistic, a human brain. There isn't a whole lot of difference apparently, except, I mean, they have, maybe they're like bananas better. I don't know what the difference is. But the point is, no matter how you extrapolate this trend, by 2030 or 2040, $1,000 will buy you a computer with the same computational capability of a human brain. And that doesn't mean it can think, right? <laughs> but, but it does mean that the hardware for our thinking thing is there, right? So the aliens have already gone, you know, maybe a million years beyond that point. And that's why I think it's an entirely reasonable argument to say that ET is not going to be these soft, squishy guys without any whites in their eyes, no hair, <laughs> no clothes, no pets, no sense of humor. All right. It's just, you know, it's not going to be these guys. It's going to be this guy. It's going to be some sort of machine. And that complicates our efforts to find ET because if it's a machine, it doesn't have to stay on a planet with oceans and atmospheres and all that sort of stuff that's required for life. All right. Well, we're mere blips in history and we continue to look for other blips in history. Namely, we try to look for analogs of ourselves. But it may be that what we will really find when we find ET is something that's totally unlike ourselves. I'm going to stop now and they can wake everybody up. <laughs> Seth, thank you so much for that. Oh my goodness. Wake everybody up. You're kidding. You're so funny. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I have a couple of takeaways. I, I, I was trying to keep up. I did not realize that the aliens and I had so much in common. Neither of us can afford to live in Silicon Valley, um, <laughs> apparently. And uh, you talked about the how fast our uh, radio and TV waves, uh, well, signals travel. I'm, I was thinking perhaps the aliens had Netflix by now, 
Um, yeah, but the no? programming is not up to snuff. Yeah. No, no, probably not. It's early Netflix. It's early Netflix. Like they're still renting and returning DVDs at this point. It's machines um, talking to one another. Yeah, and then I don't know. Maybe the aliens are playing hard to get. I don't know. Um, but you, you, when well, you talked about how much energy is actually required and how much it it would cost, and you know, maybe the aliens wouldn't be even if they invested their money wisely or they've got Bitcoin. Maybe not. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have it. Maybe a GoFundMe <laughs> on one of their planets to get a, get them here. And um, it, I was almost hurt when you said that the aliens don't know that we're here. You know, they don't. They it made it made me feel like we're the middle child of the universe. <laughs> Nobody well, pays us any minds. <laughs> yeah, it could be. I mean, you know, uh, our early TV washes over a new star system at about one a day. So, you know, if you hang out for another couple of thousand years, it's probably a good chance that some aliens will know we're here. Oh, okay. Maybe they'll get up to I Love Lucy and that <laughs> will redeem us um, in some way. If they like the jokes, yes. Yeah. Oh, let's fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. And uh, wow, thank you. You, you Freeman Dyson, uh, the Dyson Sphere, I thought had something to do with the folks that make the Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, thank you for clearing that up and you everybody participants stop laughing at me <laughs> but I listen, listen, we've got some we've got some questions well I will I will start with if you don't mind um a gentleman who just wanted to reach out and say hi Seth uh who he worked with you in the Netherlands some 40 years ago Robert Hanish if I'm saying that name correctly uh he said sends his hellos uh rick wants to know uh is there a plan to reinstitute seti at home and were there useful results from before yeah seti at home i have to make a a, a truth disclosure here uh, it was not our project it was actually cooked up by a fellow up in seattle and uh you know, a fellow that Bob Hanish might actually remember, Woody Sullivan actually called me up about it. But it was it was implemented actually by the folks at the University of California, Berkeley, about 50 miles from here across the bay. But they have shut it down uh, for very <laughs> kind of prosaic reasons, namely that it requires, you know, maintenance. And that means that somebody has to be tasked with being responsible for keeping it all running. And there's just so little money for SETI, they couldn't afford that. But it, it was, I think, uh, mostly useful in getting people interested in the whole SETI enterprise. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's the maintenance that always gets you. Yes. You know, you buy the house, somebody's got to clean it. You build the bridge, somebody's got to maintain it. I mean, we've got, we don't, we don't do Why that not? well here. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of folks who are asking, they want to know your opinion on the wow signal from 1977. Am I saying that right? I don't you know. You are. That. Okay. It's 1977. That's perfect that you, pronunciation. My, my yes. pronunciation is spot yes. on. Thank you, man. <laughs> the wow signal. Well, that look, for those who are not conversing with a wow signal, uh, it was indeed found in 1977. There was a big radio telescope. It was dubbed the Big Ear at Ohio State University in Columbus. And they were just using it to scan the sky, you know, continuously looking for signals. And every couple of days, one of the astronomers, uh, 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 would come in, Jerry Amon was his name. He would come into the observing house there and the results were coming out of a, what was called a line printer. And for the people among you who remember the early days of computers, line printers were how you got your output. And he would just you know look through it to see if there was anything interesting. And one day he found a signal that was very, very clearly strong enough to be something interesting. And it also had the right shape. Uh, and he wrote wow next to it. So it became known as the wow signal. The wow signal was seen once. It was not seen a second time. It was looked for automatically 70 seconds after it was found, which is a little over a minute. And it was not seen then. And a fellow uh, in Chicago, actually Bob Gray, has spent much time on radio telescopes in the past several decades trying to find the wow signal again. We even tried it with our Allen telescope array. It has never been seen again. So you can think that, okay, it was ET, but then ET went on lunch break uh, and wasn't yeah. there a minute later. Or you can say, well, we don't know what it was, but if you can't find it a second time, it's, it's not science to say that it was aliens. Okay. I, I, I sometimes attribute those things to someone did a bring your cat 
or toddler to work day and someone bumped into something they shouldn't have and you know now we've got lore uh so to speak uh there are uh, also a couple of people who want to know do you believe there's a great filter in the drake equation and i'm yeah. assuming this is not drake the singer from canada right this no is this is a Frank different drake uh, frank drake different i actually drake. showed you know man i showed his picture uh, Frank Drake, who's, by the way, still around. Uh, Frank uh, just turned 91 a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he's still involved. And he's still, he's, he's a wonderful guy. He's the world's last nice guy. Honestly, he is. But, oh, wow. Yeah. Put that on a dating app, the ladies will snap him right up. Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, I forgot what the question was. Uh, oh, uh, do, you, do you believe there's a great filter in the Yeah, in the there a great filter. The great filter is, is simply this. It's based, it, it's this kind of inductive reasoning that we haven't found ET and there's per perfectly good reason to think that we should have by now. And that suggests that once you get beyond our level of capability so that you could go on the air and we could learn of your presence, something happens and you're taken out of the gene pool. So it sounds like there's a great filter, whether it's nuclear war, or maybe it's, you know, I mean, everybody's brain turns to the consistency of hot oatmeal because of bad TV shows, something, right? Okay. Uh, it's it's called the Great Filter. It's a serious uh, proposal. Really? Yeah, I think it's okay. I think it's uh, this fellow at the, um, George Mason University, Robin. Uh, I'll think of his last name. But in any case, it it could be it could be. But I, I think it's a kind of a special pleading argument. There are plenty of other reasons you can offer for the lack of obvious evidence for ET that don't require such downer kind of ideas as a great filter. Okay. I, I, yeah. I like great filters, but only for my coffee, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. There also, they also want to know, like, is there an update to the Drake equation? Uh, Drake squared? I don't know if that's what they mean. Yeah, but. well, the Drake equation, I mean, I could explain that too, but it, for the people who know it, that would be really boring. For the people who don't know it, it would be really boring. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna- So actually... we call that a win-win. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, Frank tells me that he gets emails from people essentially every other day who have a new parameter for the Drake equation. They're trying to improve the wow. Drake equation. And okay. uh, his response is that every single time there are things that are already in the Drake equation. So from his point of view, it uh, doesn't need improvement. And I, I tend to believe Frank because he's a smart guy. Okay, so, so this is an issue of reading comprehension, uh, not necessarily that there's a new spin. Uh, be, on Drake. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Dan wants to know, will the next generation of uh, telescopes be able to allow us to physically view planets outside our solar system, not just the light emitted? Well, even just seeing the light emitted from the or reflected off these planets would be a big step forward. Most planets around other stars are not found directly. That is, you don't actually see them, right? Uh, you're, you're just noticing that the star may uh, move a little bit, it may oscillate back and forth or uh, towards you in a way, or that it dims because the planet gets in front of it, that kind of thing. We find these planets indirectly, not by seeing them directly. The total number of planets that have been actually seen uh, is very, very small. It's probably a dozen or fewer. Okay, wow. so yeah, well, but you know, the uh, James Webb's uh, Space Telescope will be able to see more of them. And so we will see some and you might say, well, what are you going to learn? Because they're just going to look like a dot, right? And that's true. They will look like a single pixel on the photo. And you might say, well, that's not going to be very interesting, but it could be interesting. Imagine if you could see Earth as a single pixel from somebody's telescope, uh, you know, 10 light years away. You would notice that every 24 hours, it gets brighter and darker, depending on, you know, the position of the continents and oceans and, and the cloud cover and things like that. You could actually learn something even from a one pixel photo. <laughs> so... Uh, we, maybe first of we'll all, find yeah, I mean, first off, just just a lot less to clean, <laughs> way more manageable uh, yeah, as a pixel true. planet. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see here. More questions. Uh, well, this is a fun one from Erasmo wants to know, how come most UFOs are spotted over English speaking countries? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm not sure. Or is that true? Negative. No, I don't think it's true, actually. I, I, I mean, um, I, I think it's an interesting hypothesis, though, and one could look at it. But, uh, you know, to begin with, the English speaking countries tend to have more places where you can report these things. Right. Oh, okay. There's a UFO reporting center in 
the middle of Washington State here in the United States, and they report about, well, they get about seven, 8,000 reports per year. All right. But those are just the reported ones. I mean, talk to the guy sitting next to you at Denny's. <laughs> and if it's not somebody you know, that's odd. But you could talk to them and, and ask them if they've seen a UFO. And, you know, probably 70% of them will say yes. But the number that have actually reported that is probably far fewer. So that may be one, one you know, factor in this, the fact that you can report them in the United States and some other countries. But I get, I mean, I get emails and letters and so forth from Latin America all the time. Okay. about uh, you know sightings so i don't think it's restricted to english speaking countries okay fair enough fair enough and I, you know what I, I don't know about denny's i would i would think you might get more more of that conversation um at a waffle house i'm just putting it out there denny's has really tried to improve their their image oh uh, i, I have to like denny's but then again i like waffle oh i like house i like denny's, i like denny's too but waffle house whoa that is the center of shenanigans right there that's where there might be some actual alien sightings um we don't have but, them in california because we're not yet nutty enough Although some would dispute that. Uh, well, something to look forward to and put on the bucket list. We don't have them here in New York either, but you get in that car and drive south, you're going to hit a Waffle House and you're going to be <laughs> glad you did. Uh, the food is actually good. <laughs> um, okay, Jack, and I don't know if this is a rhetorical question from Jack. Do you think that these beliefs are just wishful thinking? Well, I don't, I mean, in some sense, the most interesting thing about the whole UFO phenomenon to me is the fact that it's highly emotional, right? Uh, if you, I mean, yeah. every time I express an opinion, fortunately, this this talk will probably not be seen by people who are, you know, UFO believers. I suspect they won't be the majority of the audience. But if they they were in the audience, I would be getting a lot of hate mail tomorrow. I'm kind of used to it now. But, you know, hmm. uh, this is a highly emotional, highly emotional subject. And I think that's very interesting. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe it's, you know, akin to you know, dissing somebody's religion or something. I'm not quite sure. Uh, by the way, there was a question that popped up down here that I really did want to say something about because people were asking about Oumuamua, which is- Oh, I this, see that now, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Oumuamua is, was the first object found by us, by Homo sapiens, <laughs> that came from somebody else's solar system. It isn't a comet or an asteroid from our own solar system. But what is it? Is it a comet or an asteroid from somebody else's solar system? That's what most astronomers assume. but one very well-known astronomer, Avi Loeb, who was chair of the Harvard Astronomy uh, Department for many years, he's a very bright guy, a very nice guy, actually. Uh, he maintains that, no, he doesn't think it's very likely that it's just a random piece of junk from somebody else's solar system. He thinks that it's, you know, was sent here deliberately. That's, in fact, an, an extraterrestrial alien probe of some sort. And he's been fairly vocal about this, and uh, it gets everybody's hackles up. But he should be applauded in this sense. I mean, I don't know that he's right. I suspect he's not. If I talk to the people down the hall here who specialize in asteroids or, or even comets, they, they're very skeptical. But that aside, at least he has the chutzpah, at least he has the guts to at least say, look, when you don't understand something in the sky, at least consider that it might be what you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> I'm still skeptical, but okay. Well, so am I, but, you know. Yeah. Be that as it may. Um, this this Todd is asking a question that I feel like most of us sci-fi movie fans, you know, would ask, which is why would a species intelligent enough to get to Earth want to visit it, giving its occupants tendency towards self-destruction? I don't know. Maybe they're they're intergalactic therapists, Todd. I don't know. Maybe they know a way to fix us. Yeah, anyway. you get that a lot. You know, oh, why aren't you looking for intelligence on Earth? Well, I think Lee and you even suggested that, but. It's, it's, I mean, I've been on panels uh, in the UK on what would entice the aliens to come here? Is there anything on earth oh, that they know? The British accent for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you speak going on with a British accent, I don't know, but we, we had a hard time thinking of anything that we have that they don't have right where they are, right? I mean, all the, you know, the gold, we don't have unobtainium, but everything else is right here that's right here on earth is on their planets too. So they wouldn't come for the raw materials. They wouldn't come for the water, any of those kind of things. The only thing we could think of was, well, the culture might interest them conceivably. They wouldn't come for the science because if they can come here, they've got all that science, but what they don't have is the rock and roll. So maybe they're coming for that. I don't know if it's worth a trip of, you know, 10 light years to 
listen to our rock and roll. I mean, you can listen to it where you are, just tune it in. Well, you know, I am put in mind of that very famous Twilight Zone episode, you know, to serve man. And it's a cookbook. They came for the food, everybody. <laughs> Humans are delicious. Yeah. I mean, if I'm not careful, my cat thinks I'm delicious. So, you know, I, I can't sleep too hard because then I'm dinner. Um, mm -hmm. We've, we've, we've got about a minute or so. Um, I just want to sneak this one in before we wrap up, um, Seth, if, if that's okay. Um, John said, have, have, have Native Americans not reported alien visitors for thousands of years? Mm. Well, uh, nobody knows because, you know, they didn't have written language. So a lot of the history, which, you know, goes back 13,000 years, right? The Native American history is a very, very old one. But unfortunately, we don't know much. What you know is what's been passed down orally. And of course, there's a limit to, you know, what you can do there. But so we, we don't really know. But I mean, people do point to cave drawings and so forth and say, see, this looks like an alien spacesuit or something on this guy. And maybe it does, but it also looks like a, a Native American headdress, too. So, you know, space right. suit, headdress, spacesuit, head. So, it could have been fashion week. We don't know. You don't. You don't know. I mean, I've I've had, had the good fortune to get into some of these caves and, you know, you see some very interesting stuff from an anthropological uh, point of view, but I, I don't know that it tells you much about the aliens. Okay. Seth, I, I really want to thank you uh, for your, your time and expertise and, and your sense of humor. You're really funny. So this was this was delightful. Um, I mean, honestly, in your in your slides, you had me at Alf. How often do I get to see Alf, you know, as yeah, a where Gen is he X now? girl? That's what I want to know. Oh, man. I don't know. Probably on Dancing with the Stars. You know how these old. Probably uh, in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> We have an elf on my shelf. I probably shouldn't say that publicly, but I just did. You guys didn't hear that. Um, but Seth, thank you so much. And I want to remind you guys that if you missed anything, uh, any part of this recording, it will be available uh, tomorrow on skepticalinquirer.org. And please join us July 22nd. Sort Vice will be chatting with us about the persistent attraction of superstitious thinking. Um, of course, I want to give my thanks uh, again, to you, Seth, thank you very much. And to Skeptical Inquirer, uh, Center for Inquiry, uh, our producer, Mark Kreidler, and to you, the audience, for giving us your time and attention. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord. Thank you, and good night. Good night, Seth. Good night.